Greetings. My name is Terry Covey and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you and have a great day. Good morning to you. We do thank all of those who have served, who are serving in our military. We appreciate so much for them and for their sacrifice. I always, when we come to a time like this, I always think about a dear lady in Ohio. Her name was Esther Towns, and she was about 90 years old and the most spunkiest lady you've ever seen in your life, but she lost her son. He was like 18 or 19 years old uh, in World War II, and I always think about Mrs. Towns when we come to a day like this. I want to start a series over the next several weeks. We're going, I'm not sure exactly how long it'll take us. I want to talk about the grace of God and what is so amazing about grace. The Bible speaks so much about grace as you study through it. As a matter of fact, to go all the way back into the book of Genesis, and it says even with Noah, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But exactly what is God's grace? Well, we're going to study about that over the next several weeks and the different aspects of God's grace. A verse of scripture that has really stood out to me, I came across here a while back, is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. It says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthen, and settle you. Notice that Peter calls God the God of all grace. And as Peter's teaching through this first and second Peter, he's writing to Christians who are suffering. Many of them, their faith is being tested like gold would be tested in a fire. And as they're going through this time of persecution, I'm sure that many of them were beginning to question, is it worth it? Peter wants to assure them that indeed their faith in God, their trust in God is worth it, that God is with them, that God will help them that God actually will be glorified through them as they're going through these various trials. And actually in this passage, in this one verse, Peter's going to point out two or three different types of grace, the way that God ministers in our life, the salvation, God working through our lives, God using us for His glory. Knowing that God is with us when we're going through a difficulty is such an important truth. A guy I used to listen to all the time on the radio years ago was by the name of Steve Brown. And Steve Brown said this, the truth is that you can stand almost anything, you can serve in any situation and, and, and bear almost any burden if you know for sure that God isn't angry at you. In other words, if you know that God is on your side, that God is with you, that He's gone through this trial, this difficulty, whatever it might be, then that gives you a strength to persevere. Peter calls God the God of all grace. And as he points out in this passage, there's actually, I believe, three different ways that God's grace works in our life. And we're all going to touch on the first part of it this week. I believe that the Bible speaks of saving grace, the fact that God saves us by His grace. Then the Bible also teaches us that God strengthens us. He gives us the strength, the grace, the, the power to do, to go through any difficulty, to handle whatever it is that life might throw at us. And then there's another aspect of God's grace, and it is serving grace. And as you think about those three aspects of God's grace, one kind of builds upon another. It's the saving grace of God that caused God, while we were yet sinners, to send His Son to die for our sins. But that's not where grace ends. That's just where God's grace begins. From that saving grace, then God continues. I need God's grace just as much today as I did the day that I accepted Him as my Savior. We still live by God's grace. We, that's the strength. That's the power. When Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The strength that he's talking about there is the grace of God working in his life. And then also the Bible is going to teach us, as we will get to it eventually, that God has given us this grace. We have this grace dwelling within us so that we might serve him. And God wants to use us as vessels of his grace to other people. So we're going to study this. We're going to develop this over the next several weeks. Part number one is this, saving grace. Why don't you go to the book of Ephesians this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, there are many, many verses that I could uh, 
uh, look upon, I could, we could turn to, we could study this morning if we wanted to study about God's grace and especially how it applies to our salvation. But the part I want to talk about, the verse I want to use this morning is in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. And many of you know these two verses very well. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Paul says, for by grace, that is for by God's grace, are you saved through your faith. Through your faith in the grace, through your faith in God. Your salvation is by God's grace. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Forgiveness is a gift of God. Paul then says in verse 9, it's not of works. It's not something that you can earn. It's not something that you can accomplish. Many times when I've talked with people about their salvation, when I've talked with people about their relationship with God, oftentimes I've had people say to me, well, Pastor, I know that I need to be, I know that I need to accept the Lord, or however they want to phrase it. I know that I need to get it worked out with God or something like that. But sometimes people will say to me that, but I've just got to get some few things straight before I can do that. Well, I want to tell you something. The Bible says you will never get straight enough on your own to earn the favor of God. You can't do it. If you could do it on your own, then Jesus would not have had to have died on the cross for your sins. God the Father knew that there was no other way that you could ever have a relationship with God except for the fact that God himself would do something on his part and then God would accomplish what needed to be done and then God would give to you that as a gift. Salvation, forgiveness of your sin, being made a child of God, being come a Christian, going to heaven, however you want to phrase it, it's a gift from God. It's not by any works. It's not by anything you, you can accomplish on your own. It is purely by the fact that God wants to be gracious to us. Now, since we're going to be studying about grace, we need to determine exactly what are you talking about? What is grace? Probably the most common definition of what grace is, most people use, is that grace is unmerited favor. It's God's unmerited favor. Favor. And we're going to study about that this morning. It's the fact that we can't earn it, but the fact that God gives it to us. Unmerited means that. You, you can't earn it, you don't deserve it, and you never will deserve it. It's because God himself chose to do this. It's unmerited favor. Or maybe another way that we could rephrase that. Grace is God's kind and merciful involvement in our lives. We do not deserve for God to be involved in our lives, whether it's through salvation, whether it's just through daily living. We do not deserve that. We have all sinned, fallen short of God's glory. We have all failed God all through our lives. We do not deserve for God to be favorable to us, yet the Bible teaches us that God desires to be favorable to us because He is a gracious God. Sometimes people will say, I don't understand why God would do it for me. The reason that God wants to be gracious, merciful to you, there are many reasons, and we're going to study some of those reasons, but one of the primary reasons is this. You have been created in His image. The world and science and things like that tries to tell us, and that's part of Satan's ploy, is it tries to drag down man, and sometimes we do that even ourselves as Christians. Sometimes we spend so much energy and so much effort talking about our unworthiness, and indeed we are unworthy that we fail, we forget the fact that God created us in His own, His own image. The Bible says God did not create the angels in His image. There is nothing else as far as we know in the entire universe that has been created in the image of God except for mankind. There's something special about man that is different from anything else in the entire universe. We have God within us. We have the image. We've been made in that image of God. And so therefore God loves us more than we can even comprehend. And that's why God desires to be gracious to us. Many of you know the story about John Newton who back in the 18th century was a slave trader but how that God miraculously saved John Newton. And you know the song Amazing Grace. Just look at the first verse of that song once again. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. What's a wretch? A wretch means the bottom of the barrel. A wretch means something that is detestable. And he says, it is amazing grace. It is amazing to me. It is unbelievable that God would want to be kind and merciful in my life when I look at my life and I understand the miserable, sinful person 
that I have been in life. He says, it's an amazing grace. He says, oh, how sweet the sound, the sound of grace that would save a wretch like me. He said, I once was lost. I didn't even know where to turn. I didn't even know how to find God. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but he says, now I can see. And I believe that the people who will appreciate the grace of God the most are probably the people who are able to see, one, their own sinfulness, and then secondly, the holiness of God. You have to put those two things together to actually appreciate the fact that God would be gracious to us. Grace, as I've already said, is God's unmerited favor. Why do we say that God's grace is His unmerited favor? Well, let me give you two or three reasons. Number one, we do not deserve God's grace because the Bible says we have sinned. It says in the book of Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many does all include? Everyone. Everyone. There's not a single person that has ever lived on the face of this earth other than the Lord Jesus himself, and he was God in the flesh. But there's not a single human being that has ever lived on the face of this earth that has not sinned in their life. No one has to teach us how to sin. No one has to teach a baby how to throw a fit, how to grab something and say that it's mine. No one has to teach us how to be selfish. It's a part of our nature that we're born with. And yes, for many people, it gets worse and worse. There is a difference in a man that's full grown, the way he maybe would sin against God. There's a huge difference in that and the way that a child will sin against God. But yet the Bible says in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, we're born with that sin nature. It's a part of our being that we have inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. We've all sinned against God. The Bible says we all are sinners. How did we become sinners? Well, it says also in the book of Roman, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and then death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Who is that one man that that passage is speaking of? Speaking of Adam, speaking of the first man, of the first parents, you know the story there in Genesis chapter 3, how that God placed Adam and Eve in this garden called Eden. It was paradise. They had everything they could ever possibly hope or want or imagine. There was one tree placed in the midst of that garden. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam and Eve that you can have everything in this garden to enjoy as much as you need it. There's only one restriction that I place upon you is that you are not to eat of that fruit of that tree that is in the midst of the garden. What did Adam and Eve do? They ate of it. They disobeyed God. They willfully and deliberately rebelled against what they knew in their heart and in their spirit was contrary to the will of God. Eve said that to Satan. She even elaborated on it. She knew clearly what it was. Adam knew clearly what it was that he was doing. And they willfully rebelled against God's command. And when they did that, the Bible says they brought sin into the world. They brought sin into mankind. Because they sinned, they then passed down, according to the Bible, they then passed down that sin nature to their children. You remember the next story. You get to Genesis chapter 4. Cain killed his brother Abel. The very first son became a murderer. Why was he a murderer? Because he inherited that rebellious, sinful nature. He inherited from his parents. And from that, from one generation to the next, it's been passed down throughout mankind until even to us today. We, have, we were born with this sin nature. We inherited from our parents. Paul says in this passage for us, by one man, sin itself entered into the world, and then therefore the penalty of sin. What did God tell Adam and Eve what happened to them in the day that they disobeyed him? What did he say? What would be the consequence? You'll surely die. You'll die. Genesis 2, 17. You will surely die the day that you disobey me. And as you read on in the book of Genesis, you will find that Adam and Eve, really they died in three ways, in three facets. First of all, they died spiritually. The first thing that Adam and Eve, before they had sinned, they had this fellowship with God. They had this relationship with God. They communicated and talked with God openly, as great as probably you'll have in heaven. But as soon as they sinned against God, they then began to try to hide themselves from God. They experienced a spiritual death. 
You go on in the book of Genesis, and even though they lived to be several hundred years old, you will find that Adam and Eve eventually physically died. And according to the book of Revelation chapter 20, except by the grace of God, they would have eternally died. They would have eternally been sentenced into a lake of fire called hell. The Bible says that is the second death. Death affects us in three ways because of sin. It affects us spiritually, it affects us physically, and it will affect us eternally except for the grace of God. Do you know, you realize that there would have been no death if Adam and Eve had never sinned against God? There would have been no death in mankind. There would have been no death in the animals. An infant would never have died even before childbirth. Why does that happen? Why, why does that happen? I think about that sometimes. Why does it happen that an infant, and maybe some of you have experienced this, an infant would die even before it's born? You know why? Because it is the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. Death, sickness, disease, decay, thorns, thistles, cancer, heart attacks, car wrecks, all of the calamity, all of the tragedy that is in this world is the result of the curse that was placed upon mankind because of Adam and Eve's willful disobedience to God. They disobeyed against God. They rebelled against God. They brought sin into humanity. And the Bible says they brought death into hum humanity. And so Paul says, and so therefore, as by this one man, Adam, sin entered into the human race. And so therefore, the consequence of that sin, death by sin. And so therefore, death has passed upon all men for that all have sinned. All have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. Now that, many people resent that. Many people are offended by that, that you would actually say that everyone, that, that maybe they're a sinner. Some people would say, well, maybe I'm, I know I'm not a perfect person, but I really don't like the title of being called a sinner. Yet it says in the book of Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 12 and many verses there, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 12 says, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. How many righteous people are there in the world on their own? How many? None. How many people in this world are actually doing good in the sight of God? None. You say, really? Do you honestly believe that? Well, I'm, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as this guy. And see, one of our problems, the way that we determine the definition of good is that we compare ourselves with each other. Probably what we need to say is, well, I'm not as bad as they are. Maybe that's the truth. Maybe you're not as bad as they are. But the Bible says, and your goodness compared to the, what goodness really is, the goodness, perfection, righteousness of God, the Bible says there's none good. No, not one. Jesus said, one day somebody said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told the man, he said, why callest thou me good? There's only one good, and that is God. The reason Jesus was saying that day is he's saying by the fact that you are calling me good, then apparently you attribute to me the fact that I am God, and indeed Jesus is God. I believe that one of the primary reasons we struggle so much with being called sinner and dealing with the sinner in our life is because we have such a shallow view of the holiness of God. We forget what it means that God is holy. Back in the Old Testament, there was a prophet by the name of Isaiah. And comparatively speaking, Isaiah was a very righteous. Comparatively speaking, Isaiah was a very good man. Yet the Bible says one day God brought Isaiah into his presence. And when Isaiah received this vision of God, when Isaiah actually began to realize what holiness was, this is what this good man said, Woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. You know what Isaiah was saying? Isaiah probably up to that point in time thought that he was a good man. Isaiah was being, he was under a religious system where you tried to earn your way to heaven by following the law of Moses. And probably up until that point in time, I don't know for sure, but maybe up to that point in time that Isaiah thought, I am a pretty good man, until Isaiah actually saw what goodness was. When actually he was brought then into the presence of holy God, what Isaiah is actually saying in that passage is this, I'm dirty. I am dirty. Dirty. 
in the sight of what purity actually is. And Isaiah saying, because I now realize just how dirty I am in the presence of God. He said, I realize, therefore, that I do not deserve heaven. I'm a man. I'm undone, he says. I deserve to be judged. Isaiah was not the only man that had that experience when he actually came encountered with God, had an encounter with God. Peter, when Peter met the Lord Jesus, Peter said back to Jesus, depart from me for I am a sinful man. The Bible says later that John the apostle, when he saw the glorified Jesus, the Bible says that John fell at the feet of Jesus as though John was a dead man. People in the church probably would have said John was a good man. And probably comparatively speaking, John was a good man compared to everyone else. But when John actually saw the Lord Jesus, the Bible says that he was in such awe of what true holiness actually was that he fell before the feet of God as though he was a dead man. Are we actually that dirty? A word sometimes is used as the word depraved. Sometimes people write, write about the total depravity of man. What does that mean? that mankind is depraved. What does that mean that we're totally depraved? The word depraved means we're vile, we're corrupt, we're wicked. Chuck Swindoll wrote this. He said, if depravity was the color blue and you would cut a man, that man would bleed blue. In other words, we're totally depraved. We're depraved from the inside out. It is who we are. Perhaps you're saying, Pastor, I think you're exaggerating about this. Let me read something to you from the book of Romans. I've already read part of it, but listen as I listen, read to you the rest of this passage. It says in Romans chapter 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. And what, by that it means who truly understands who God is. There is none that is truly seeking after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. A sepulcher is a tomb, a grave. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. You say, really? Well, let me ask yourself, what do you think God says about some of the things that you say about other people? Let's just take that category. How do you think that God would appraise how you judge other people and what maybe you would say about someone else? The Bible says that's like a putrid grave. Those words that come out of our mouth sometimes that we think maybe are righteous words, the Bible says in the presence of righteousness, true righteousness, even those words are like a putrid stench that would come out of a grave. The Bible goes on to say, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. We're so quick to get angry, aren't we? So quickly to get mad at other people. So quickly to want revenge against someone else. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. And he says, actually, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Again, you, look, you read that, and oftentimes I've read it, and I'm thinking, Really? Is everyone that bad? Am I that bad? Surely I'm not that bad. Yet it says in the book of Jeremiah that our own heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We do not even understand the depravity of our own heart. We, we can't even understand what true sinfulness because we don't really understand what true holiness is. We do not deserve the grace of God because we're all sinful. Not only that, we do not deserve the grace of God because the Bible says there is nothing that we can do to earn it on our own. It says in the book of Jude, verse 24, that anything our flesh touches contaminates it. Because of our nature, who we are, and what I'm talking about is comparison to God. The way that God, he says, depraved, uh, humanity is so depraved that anything that humanity would try to, any good works that they would try to produce on their own. As a matter of fact, Isaiah says this, even our self-righteous acts are like filthy rags in the sight of God. You're saying, whoa, pastor, I didn't come to church today to be beat up. Well, I'm not trying to beat you up today, but I believe that we will not truly appreciate the kind, merciful favor of God until we understand 
the way God looks at it. As long as we just make the appraisal in our own mind and compare ourselves with each other, and as long as we have such a shallow view of God, if we have a shallow view of God, we will have a shallow view of sin. And so therefore, if we have a shallow view of God and we have a shallow view of sin, then really grace doesn't mean that much to us. We talk about it, we sing about it, but we really don't think about it. But yet when we step back and we begin to realize how unworthy we are in the sight of God, and I can't even, I prayed this week and didn't even know how to express to you the chasm that there is between us and God on our own. I don't even know, I don't understand it myself. I don't even know how to explain it other than what few verses I've shared with you from God's Word. The Bible says, though, grace, listen, please. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is not God's tolerance. Grace is God's favor. Favor is way beyond tolerance. If it was just God is willing to tolerate us, then it means that God would just, okay, I won't do anything about it, but I'll just leave you in that state. I'll just turn away from it. But the Bible says grace is not just the fact that God would tolerate us in this sinfulness, but that holy God would desire to favor us. He would desire to pour out His blessings upon us. Let me, I was trying to think of a way to explain this, and I came up with this little illustration. Let's suppose that, that someone would break into your house while you were away, and they would brutally murder your family. Brutally murder your family. And when you would find out about that, rather than wanting revenge against that person, you would go and look for that person so that you could show favor to that person. While everyone would say, you're crazy. Even the person who would commit the crime would say, you're crazy to want to show, don't you understand? I murdered your family and you want to show favor for me? You're crazy. You know what grace is? Listen, grace is crazy love. There is no human reason for grace. There is no human basis for grace. Love for us is something that someone has to earn or they have to merit or at least they have to perform in the way that we want them to perform. And as long as they perform in that way, as long as they merit our love, then we will love them. Yet for somebody to go out and to actually love someone who had brutally murdered their family, it is crazy. It doesn't make sense. And humanly speaking, grace does not make sense. It is if I can borrow the phrase from Francis Chan, it is crazy love for God to be willing to do this. Why would God choose to be so gracious to sinful men? Look at verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened or made us alive together with Christ, for by God's unmerited favor you've been saved. And not only that, He's raised you up together and made you sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's given you a seat in His holy heaven. Verse 7, so that in the ages to come, God might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Let me share with you two or three reasons why God, I believe, would choose to be so gracious to sinful men. Number one is this. The Bible says, because God is rich in grace and mercy. The word rich there means abundantly wealthy. God was gracious. Grace was a part of God's nature even before there was a need for grace. It is a part of His unchanging eternal nature. The Bible, sometimes people will say, why in the world would God create sinful mankind knowing that they were going to sin? Because God wanted to extend His grace. God wanted to extend His unmerited favor to people who would not deserve it. And the reason God wanted to extend that is because God is abundantly wealthy in grace. Many years ago, a, name by the, a woman by the name of Julia Johnson wrote a song and the first verse and course of that song says, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. 
Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sins. There is no one that is too low to receive the grace of God. Matter of fact, the greater the depth of their sin, the more God is glorified by showing this crazy kind of love to them. One of the reasons God, I believe, chooses to be gracious to us because the Bible says God is rich in grace and mercy. Secondly, because grace is a part of his eternal nature. Peter says, the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. The Bible, here's the plan. Actually, if you'll, the Bible in a nutshell is that before God created the world, God was gracious and God wanted to extend his grace. And so God created mankind and he put them in a garden and he gave them one restriction, knowing that they would not be able to keep even one restriction. Then he gave them the law so that they could try to work it out on their own. And they realized the futility of that, that they actually could not perform good enough and work it out on their own. So that in the fullness of time, God could send his son and say, this is what true grace actually is. You're wicked, putrid, depraved people who do not deserve this. But because this is who I have always been. I want to extend this favor to you and the price will be the death of my son on the cross so that in eternity future you will praise God forever and forever and forever for his attribute of being gracious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A million billion years from now the saints in heaven will be singing amazing grace. It will always be a part of us because God created us. That was part of his plan always to create us so that we will always Praise Him. And the church cannot make enough of God's grace. We cannot sing enough about God's grace. We cannot praise God enough about God's grace. And any time we have the audacity on our own to think that somehow we're doing part of it, we're robbing God of His glory. It's all about the glory of God and the way we bring glory to God is by allowing God to save us by His grace. And as my pastor used to say years ago, then we become a trophy of God's grace. You go into a man's house and he's got a trophy there. You see he's got a trophy and it's got a softball and it's got a bat. Where'd you get that trophy? I got that trophy for playing softball. Got that trophy for winning the championship. And so that trophy is a symbol of that man's greatness in that sport. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm a trophy that God could take. A boy raised on a dirt road out in the middle of nowhere that was a sinner. I'm a kid. I'm a kid. And that God would be gracious enough to want to steer my family to church so that we would hear the gospel so that we would all be saved, so that our children could be saved. And then God would say, I'm going to really do something with you. <laughs> I will make you a preacher. And for 12 years I said, there's no way. You don't understand who I am. There's no way that you could ever do this with me, God. Until finally one night God broke me and I, broke, I fell before God and I said, if you can use me, you can use me. And it's now close to 20 years and Ministry plus the school. And it's all to the glory of God. Any good that anyone would ever see in me, I can tell you right now, it's just to the, I just praise Jesus. I just praise God for being so gracious. And that's what he says. God desires to receive glory for his grace. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Here's the plan of God, the eternal plan of God. The mysteries, the Bible sometimes calls it. According as God hath chosen us in Jesus before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Predestination, election, all of that, it's so hard to understand. The free will of man. The Bible says before the foundation of the world, God had this plan. So that through this plan, God would receive praise 
for the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, that is in Jesus. In Jesus we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. How do we receive such grace? Look back again in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible says that God so loves the world. Jesus said that. It says in the book of Titus, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. God's grace, His free forgiveness is, is available to you. It's available to everyone who's ever lived on the face of this earth. God has created you for that person, for that purpose, so that you might receive this free gift of forgiveness and exchange, turn around and praise God for being so gracious to you. Jesus said it in other terms, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but could receive the grace of God. That's what everlasting life is. The grace of God. It is a free gift from God. It is not something that we can earn or work on our own. It is something that we must receive by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. What does the word faith mean? As I was studying this, something came back to my mind that I heard many years ago. Tammy and I grew up under such a great pastor and he made everything so simple for us. And he used to say that you could define grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. And he says you could define faith as forsaking all, I take him. Forsaking all, forsaking myself, forsaking my sin, forsaking my own self-righteousness, forsaking my independence, forsaking all, I take him, I take Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever received the grace of God? Have you ever received that free gift of forgiveness? I've tried to make it as simple and as plain as I could this morning in one message to you what it means. Without that grace, without that forgiveness, you are destined to spend eternity in hell. The Bible says that. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 that mankind will stand before God and the books will be opened and every man will be judged according to his or her works. Individually. And if you do not receive God's free gift of forgiveness, one day, you as an individual, it doesn't matter if you attend Twin Oaks, it doesn't matter who your family is, it doesn't matter who your friends are, you as an individual will have to stand before God and give an account for how you have sinned against the holiness of God. But the Bible says God loves you. God loves you as much as He loves me. The Bible says God loves you so much that God made a plan and that plan was to send His Son to this earth to be born as a baby, Christmas, so that He could grow up and then as a man take your place by dying on the cross for your sins. And the Bible says, by faith, Simply trusting, simply believing that you have, that what I'm telling you is the truth and that you have no other hope than Jesus. And by faith, reaching out and receiving that free gift that God wants to give to you. Have you done that? Have you made that personal decision on your own? If you have not, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now, today is the accepted time. The reason you're here today is because God has brought you here today to hear this message. This message was for you today so that you could hear it and so that you could receive this free gift. You say, what do I do, Pastor? I don't know for sure what to do. We're going to stand to our feet as a congregation and we're going to sing a song. And here's what everyone else, probably almost everyone else in this room that's ever been saved, this is what they did and this is what I want you to do today. As we're singing this song, I want you to just step out from where you're seated and walk towards the front, towards me. And myself or Pastor Zach will meet you here.
And we will just sit down with you quietly and show you from the Bible and pray with you and make it as simple as possible for you to understand. You'd say, I don't think I can do that. That would be too hard. I know how you feel. We all who've been saved know how you feel. But I believe that there are many people. How many people in this room could testify, yes, it is a scary thing to do, but once you take that first step, it's a, look, look around and see. We all experience that same feeling as well. But once you step out to receive the grace of God, it's unbelievable how wonderful it is.